Hi, this is Vic Nitty, Chair of the AUA Office of Education, and I'd like to welcome you to another AUA Office of Education podcast. Today's podcast is on framing pragmatic strategies to reduce mortality from urothelial cancer. And I am very happy to introduce my co-host, Dr. Rafe DeVere White. Dr. DeVere White is a urologic oncologist and the past chair of urology and past director of the UC Davis Comprehensive Care Center, as well as the past president of the Society for Urologic Oncology. Uh, he has published extensively uh, on the topic of urothelial cancer. And before um, uh, I formally uh, let Rafe speak, I just want to say that this podcast is a little bit unique in that um, he came to me with this because this is something that he is so passionate about in making sure that we are uh, providing the very best treatment to our patients with bladder cancer and not letting um, and not letting urothelial cancer patients sort of slip through the cracks and uh, and progress. So with that said, Rafe, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So tell me what your inspiration was for, uh, uh, for or tell the audience what your inspiration was for, uh, for doing this podcast. So uh, my inspiration for this uh, is uh, the sort of understanding which I came to uh, about 18 months ago. We were at a meeting, I was on a panel with Peter Black, and we were talking about the fact that there's been no improvement in survival for bladder cancer in the last 30 years. And uh, Peter lent to me after the discussion and said, well, of course, if we don't treat the disease, we can't improve its survival. So that is what sent me down this path. So despite the fact that uh, we in the urologic community may think we're uh, treating the disease in a state-of-the-art way, um, I guess perhaps you feel otherwise. Well, I think or the, the data evidence says that, otherwise. Just the evidence, you know, the evidence just shows it. Uh, you know, in the last, as I said, 30 years, we have not improved survival. I mean, last year, about 17,200 patients died from bladder cancer. So if we don't change something, then why is this going to change in the next 30 years? And if you look at the American Cancer Society survival for local regional disease, it was 39% in 2017 and 35% in 2018. So, I mean, this is pretty miserable. And the other side of this is this is a very expensive disease to treat. I mean, we spent a decade ago $4 billion a year treating bladder cancer. We're now at just about uh, $5 billion. So over the last decade, we've added a billion a year to treating this disease with no improvement in survival. That is not a great return on investment. So why do you think survival has been so, so poor? Well, there are, it's never going to be just one reason. And if you had asked me before uh, Peter Black talked to me, you know, it was, we thought we needed new and more effective chemotherapies or other treatments. And then we always talked about all the shortcoming of radical cystectomies and whether you did use neoadjuvant chemo or no dissection. So the first hint that I must say I did not pay attention to was if you look at the survival from bla uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer reported either by individual institutions, cooperative groups, or meta-analysis, the survival is just infinitely better than what the ACS is showing. So just, you know, there was a recent meta-analysis for radical cystectomy, over 28,000 patients, and the disease-specific survival for T2 disease is 79%. If you now add neoadjuvant chemo, there is a subset of about 40 patients where the survival is 85%. If you look at trimodal therapy, and it's the same meta-analysis, about 3,500 patients, the survival is 69%. And there are less patients, but if you look at the meta-analysis for starting with definitive chemotherapy, the survival is 72%. So if you're setting out to be treated for your bladder cancer, this is the best you can do. 
So where do we get to the 39% nationally? And if you say, well, I've given you a disease specific survival, but even if you take the overall survival, you're at uh, 49%, 50%, 85%, and 65% for those uh, patients. So the first issue is there's a huge disconnect between the survival reported by the American Cancer Society and the survival supported by big uh, reports. So we think that a large reason that this is happening is because patients are not being treated with intent to cure them. And there are really only two papers we could find that directly address this issue. And the first is a very large 28,000 patient cohort taken from the National Cancer Database by Gray and his colleagues in 2013. And if you looked at the patients who were 50 years or younger, now remember the median age for these patients presenting is 73 years old. So this is a very young group. So 62% of them actually had a cystectomy, but 15% of them got observation. When you get to the 61 to 70 age group, cystectomy is now 56% and observation is 19%. But even more worrying is the paper from Gore and his colleagues published in 2010. Now, they looked at 3,200 patients who had stage two uh, bladder cancer, but they were all Medicare patients. And now the database was the SEER database. And of this 3,200 patients, radical cystectomy was given to 21% of these patients. And their five-year survival is 42% with very tight confidence limits. A staggering, at least staggering to me, 51% of these patients were treated by surveillance. And their five-year survival is 14.5%. Again, very, very tight confidence limits of 13 to 16%. So, 51% of our Medicare patients are having a 14.5% survival for muscle invasive disease. So they came up with three reasons. The first was patient's age, and, and the second was comorbidity. So when you look at their youngest age group, 66 to 69, uh, 132 patients had a radical cystectomy but 125 patients had surveillance. So age isn't a factor because this is their youngest age group. And I think it is just unbelievable that in this age group, the same number of patients who had a radical cystectomy are fit for no treatment, are fit only for surveillance. And one of the, the third factor that mitigated against a patient getting a radical cystectomy was the distance they lived from a center that offered radical cystectomy. And by the time you got to 50 years, uh, 50 miles, my apologies, your chance of getting a cystectomy had decreased by 40%. So these figures to us say that an awful lot of patients who have muscle invasive bladder cancer are being inappropriately treated. And that is being kind if we're saying that surveillance is really a treatment. So, so now, so Rafe, what, what other than offering more patient cystectomies at, at uh, you know, at that T2 stage, um, do you think that more aggressive local treatment of T2 disease, whether it be trimodal therapy, whether immunotherapy in the future may play a role um, for patients who truly, I, I mean, it sounds to me like many of these patients are not patients that truly couldn't have a cystectomy, but um, maybe not being treated aggressively for reasons of, I don't know, convenient so to speak if it if it's a travel issue um 
Do you think that we can get at these patients in a more aggressive way and still do bladder preserving surgery, uh, bladder preserving treatment? Well, absolutely. I think that what we need to do is not just talk at, at all the meetings and really educational uh, courses that are offered. And the AUA and the SUO, I mean, has offered just a myriad of these educational activities over the last uh, decades. And the vast majority of conversations will focus on, you know, why cystectomy is the treatment of choice, how it can be made better with neoadjuvant chemo, and then there'll be a discussion on should you do this open or robotically, and then there'll be a discussion on what type of diversion you use. We're back again from the. So, there I have yet to hear a discussion that says, okay, I mean there are patients who, for different reasons, won't undergo a cystectomy, and so if you're then going to look at other forms of treatment that we just went through, you need to compare their survival, not to cystectomy, but to surveillance, which is obviously the default choice. So if you're one of those 51% going in surveillance, you have a 14% survival, and you are turning down a somewhere, let's say 50% survival with one of the other treatments. So this seems in a sense, relatively simple. We need to help urologists, because this is still starting as a urological disease, to provide these patients what is the best form of treatment with intent to cure that is feasible for the patients. I mean, and when you look at the travel distance, I mean, last year, there was a survey of Americans and 51% said, it would be impossible or very difficult for them to come up with $500 for an emergency. So if you're taking a median age of 74 and you think of the expense to the patient and his family, we cannot, I think, just say the only treatment for this is having a radical cystectomy. And I think we have been helped by the NCCN guidelines that came out in uh, December clearly says the trimodal therapy for patients with muscle invasive disease. Now, a select group, you don't have a lot of CIS, it's not too big, there's no hydro, it's a single tumor, they do as well. So at least this offers an opportunity. So now the question really becomes, how do we get patients who are not maybe having a cystectomy to have another treatment with intent to cure? So personally, I think that we do need leadership, the AUA, SUO leadership, to sort of recognize this as being an important problem and saying that we need to come up with some way in which it is addressed. I think if that doesn't happen, it's going to be very, very hard uh, to go further. I think we need to sort of, as I said, have some different emphasis in our education that says, patients need to get, where possible, treatment with intent to cure. So, I mean, I think it'd be very simple if you had doctors who are treating this disease, just sort of on the chart right down, just three treatment choices. Some patients, yes, will go in hospice. Some will go in palliative care. And the rest will go on intent to cure. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to cure everyone, but that's the intent. I think merely doing this is going to be a great help. But last year, the uh, AUA Office of Education, uh, as you know, published in Urology Times in October, a survey from urologists who treat bladder cancer. So it wasn't everyone. And 91% reported that they follow guidelines for treating non-muscle invasive urothelial cancer. So you could be forgiven for saying we don't have a problem. But every single guideline says that if your first resection shows you have T1 disease, you need a second resection because that will, in 48% of cases, find more T1 disease. And in one third of cases, will actually find muscle invasive disease. And yet, you know, as we reported the SUO last year, 
15% of people in this country with T1 disease get a re-resection. Now, that's a big difference in 91%. And 89% of urologists reported they were following guidelines for treating muscle invasive disease. And there is no guideline that says 51% of patients should be on surveillance. So there's a huge gap between what urologists believe they are doing, namely following guidelines, and what is actually occurring. Now, I think this is very encouraging is how I would look at this. Because what this says is that the urologists value guidelines. They actually believe they are following them. So therefore, you'd hope that they would actually be open to help in accomplishing goals of actually following these guidelines. This at least would be a starting point, Victor. Right. And I think, you know, when you do surveys, as you alluded to, um, you could get a disproportionate number of patients who are answering that survey that are truly treating bladder cancer on a regular basis and maybe doing a better job. But it seems like we have to get this message, uh, this following guidelines message and this treat with intent to cure message out to um, urologists who perhaps aren't in the academic centers, who perhaps are not being um, pressed by their colleagues and by their trainees to make sure that guidelines are being appropriately followed and make sure that that you really do follow those guidelines. And um, yes, it may not be the greatest news to tell a, a, a patient, you know what, I think I got all your tumor out, but I have to go back in there and and take another look and take some more tissue. But at the end of the day, if it's the right thing to do, then it's the right thing to do. Well, yes. And I think you actually bring up a very, very good point. Because I think most urologists, if they have done their outpatient cysto and they think this is clearly a non-muscle invasive disease, tell the patient, okay, we're going to bring you in, we're going to resect it, hopefully we're going to put some gemcitabine in your bladder afterwards. And then the patient comes back and it's T1. So now the doctor finds it difficult, I think, to go back in and sort of say, yes, I resected it, yes, it's T1, but I have to bring you back and do it again. So one way of dealing with this is that I think urologists should tell patients before they go to the OR that we're going to resect it, we don't want to take more of your bladder than we have to, but if it is this T1 disease, then we will need to do a re-resection. So the patient understands it, understands it's not a fault of the doctors in any way. I mean, I think that would be a very yeah. simple way. I think that's I think that's a great idea because if the patient's prepared for that, if you don't have to go back, it's great news. If you do have to go back, okay, this isn't so terribly unexpected. I was told yes. that this could happen. So I think I think that's a great idea. And and I think we tend to not do that. You know, we um, I, I guess many people like to be the bearers of good news and not necessarily bad news. But I think that this uh, certainly it, it, it helps the patient. And I think it also helps the doctor to to feel more comfortable that, hey, I got to go back. But this happens a fairly high percentage of time. So um, really not, you know, not out of not out of the uh, out of the expected. No, it isn't out of the expected. And I, I just, you know, I don't think we have taught people to do it. And for many years, let me say, I did not do it. So it, it was only really when I saw these figures uh, about the non-compliance that I said, okay, probably best to tell patients up front so they're not taken by surprise and they don't think it's your fault. But, you know, I have to believe just from looking at the numbers that you presented, that if you take the large number of patients off of surveillance and put them on a, a you know, an intent to cure protocol, you know, even increasing survival from 14 percent to 50 percent, that's a significant number of people. And then you start to see a dent in uh, in in overall survival from urothelial cancer. Yes, and I, I think that the other thing to bear in mind is that we are just suggesting that doctors and their patients and 
you know, urologists aren't going to do this alone. It's going to be done with radiation oncologists, it's going to be done with our medical oncology colleagues. And I think one of the things we need to do is sort of set up a support system. And, you know, you can now do this so easy with telemedicine. And if you think about it, uh, the NCI designated cancer centers, I mean, when you're reviewed, only two things really come up. The first is what impact you're having. And the second is what are you doing to help your catchment area? I mean, this would seem like such an easy way for designated cancer centers to help their catchment area. I think also when you come to patients who, you know, may have had, say, initial chemotherapy and they have a scar in their bladder, I think some urologists are sort of very reluctant in, to go and biopsy that, you know, for worry that you're going to perforate or other things going to happen. On the other hand, the patient knows that, A, that's not very likely, but secondly, it's that or a cystectomy. And then, you know, patients who went through this treatment at home, either depending on the radiation oncology available, depending on the metal oncology available, let's say they, they are in those that the cancer does not go away or comes back. At least you've got down to a much more select group who, again, you maybe could try and get to go to a center that does radical cystectomies. And, you know, when... I, I, when you look at the complication rate from radical cystectomies, I mean, it is large. I mean, there was a very nice paper in 2014. And if you look at the 90-day mortality, overall, it was 7.2%. And 52% of hospitals, now not doctors, hospitals, doing cystectomies do 10 or less. And their mortality was 8%. So just think of this, 100 patients go in to have a cystectomy and eight of them have died within three months. So no wonder this is not something that smaller hospitals, doctors who don't do a lot, really want to take on. And you say, well, what happens if you take the very best of institutions? Well, I, don't, I think everyone would agree that USC knows a lot about doing cystectomies. And they reported in 2017 that in 169 cases, they had major complications in 24, an ER visit in 38%, a readmit within 30%, and 4% of patients died. So I, I think just focusing on just increasing cystectomies, I don't think is going to serve a large percentage of patients well. So I think we have to be more open to what are the patient's circumstances? What is it they want to do? What is the expertise available in their community? And then try and get them to get the best possible treatment with intent to cure. You know, th this is a real lesson learned because of course we always think about, you know, what's the next greatest, uh, chemotherapeutic or immunotherapeutic agent uh, to treat urothelial cancer or any cancer for that matter. But, you know, from, from what I'm hearing from you is we already have the tools to make significant improvements. We have guidelines. We have to use them. We have to use them all the time or at least most of the time. Um, we have treatments that are not cystectomy that do help um, a fair number of patients. We need to use those treatments. And then, of course, hopefully, uh, with that said, um, the, treatments that we, the treatments that we have available to us will get even better in the years to come with perhaps better chemotherapeutic or, or immunotherapeutic options for patients. But, um, you know, if we don't use them, it doesn't matter uh, if we have them. Exactly. And I think if one just goes back to the prostate cancer situation when, you know, really the whole thing of active surveillance came up uh, over the last decade, you know, this, this stimulated a lot of research. I mean, I think there are now six molecular tests uh, now available to you to decide who to biopsy, who to re-biopsy, who needs treatment. So, I think if one did this, we got more patients going on active therapy. This will stimulate, I think, its own research, its own uh, sort of interest. And 
will hopefully move the field along further because we do need more research dollars for bladder cancer. I mean, for the number of cases, for the expense, it is very, very poorly funded. Well, Rafe, I would really like to uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, uh, to give us this message. I think it's an important message and one that's easily uh, adaptable. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience for listening. And I'd also like to remind the audience um, that we have the AUA guidelines. They are available uh, on the AUA uh, website or on the uh, AUA guidelines app. Uh, there are a number of offerings uh, at the annual meeting uh, for educational opportunities uh, on the treatment of urothelial cancer, both uh, uh, in the non-muscle invasive stage and in the muscle invasive stage and alternatives to cystectomy, et cetera. So I would urge uh, those of you uh, in whom this is a big part of your practice uh, to uh, uh, think about um, uh, attending some of those courses if you're at the annual meeting. Uh, Rafe, uh, again, uh, thank you so much for uh, delivering this very important message. Thank you very much for having me, Victor.